All right, guys, here it is. Topic 12, thermodynamics. We're going to be talking about um, energy and chemical reactions. And it reminds me of some advice my father gave me when I was younger. He said, you know, always fight fire with fire. That might be why he never became a firefighter. Might be. I don't know. Anyways, thermodynamics. Let's talk about that, uh, shall we? So um, thermodynamics, we have two laws in thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is that um, energy is conserved. So it's the conservation of energy is the first law of thermodynamics. And here we've got a little illustration of that. A lady's on a bicycle. She's using chemical energy to make her muscles move, which is move, and the movement is kinetic energy. She's transferring that through mechanical energy. She's turning, she's, she's turning the gears here through a chain turning a wheel, which is turning a um, motor, which is uh, spinning a magnet in here with wires wrapped around the magnet. Um, and that's moving electrons, so turning that into electrical energy. And that electrical energy is then powering this projector that says energy conservation. Anyways, um, the point of this is, is that energy is being um, neither created nor destroyed. So energy is neither created nor destroyed. Energy of the universe is constant. Energy can be converted in chemical processes. So what we see here is a lot of conversion of energy, um, but energy itself is neither created nor destroyed. The energy of the universe is constant. That's the first law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics is that if a process is spontaneous in one direction, then it cannot be spontaneous in the reverse direction. So let me give you an example with something that might be a little more relatable. If we take some table salt, if we take table salt, which is solid sodium chloride, that S represents solid, and we put it in water, then it dissolves. We notice that spontaneously the salt disappears. So how we represent that would be AQ means aqueous. So solid sodium chloride turns into sodium ions and chloride ions. They're dissolved in water and that's what this aqueous means. It's no longer a solid, it's something that's in a solution. So solid table salt will spontaneously dissolve into ions when added to water. The second law of thermodynamics would say that the opposite is not true. That if we have solution of sodium ions and chloride ions, in solution it doesn't spontaneously form a solid, a sodium chloride, which this would be um, an example of a precipitate. Sodium and chloride do not make a precipitate of sodium chloride in solution. If you remove the water, that can happen, but that's not spontaneous. It's going to cost energy to remove the water. When you remove the water, the salt, um, the salts will come together, and that's why you get that residue in fountains and stuff like that when water uh, removes, and the salts will come together. Okay. I love vocabulary. Okay. Certain reactions release heat, while others absorb heat. So sometimes reactions release heat, and sometimes reactions absorb heat. Easiest thing I think we can all relate to is hot and cold packs. In a hot pack, um, when we activate a hot pack, it releases heat. And in this situation, we have iron reacting with oxygen to produce iron 3 oxide, and it's releasing heat. And this Kj, uh, this is kilojoules, and joules is a measurement of energy. So we're talking about the energy released in, in the form of heat. Um, in a hot pack, whereas in a cold pack, um, to break down ammonium nitrate to, into the ions, the aqueous solution of ammonium ions and nitrite ions, um, it requires heat. So heat in this situation is a reactant. It requires heat for this to happen. If there is no heat available, this reaction doesn't happen. Whereas opposite is true in a hot pack that when this reaction happens, one of the products is heat. So if you're on the outside, this heat is going towards you in a hot pack, a warm pack, and if you're on the outside um, and you're letting this touch you, heat is leaving you and going into this system and therefore you're losing heat and you're feeling cold. And that's what we call a cold pack. <clears throat> so talking about the first law of conservation of energy is law um, um, is that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So when we talk about this, um, energy of a system plus the surroundings is the universe. So when I mean energy cannot be created nor destroyed, 
is that the universe is not gaining or losing energy because you might think okay if I've got some ice that's melting um, it's certainly gaining energy when the ice melts it's taking energy in it, and it's and it's gaining energy so how can that be true that energy can't be created nor destroyed because I see that ice melting is, a, is an example of gaining energy well what I'm talking about here is that the ice in this example would be the system um, the ice is the system and the surroundings would be losing energy to warm the ice so in the case in this case the system can be defined as the ice so that's the, the system and the surroundings may be defined as the hot plate the air and the remainder of the whole universe everything in the universe besides this ice is the surroundings since the universe doesn't gain or lose the energy that the system got that the ice got was the energy that the surroundings lost and overall the universe will never change um, its overall energy and that's the first law of thermodynamics so the energy gained to the water is equal to the energy lost by the surroundings enthalpy is not something we can measure we cannot measure the actual energy or enthalpy of a substance we can measure the mass of something or the length of something or the density of something or the temperature of something but we can't measure the enthalpy of something we don't have like a, a enthalpy balance but when we have a reaction we can we can measure the change in enthalpy we can measure how much energy was released in heat and how much of the substance reacted and that's what enthalpy is all about so we can measure the change in enthalpy but not the enthalpy itself uh, and that is the heat released or absorbed in chemical reactions that's what enthalpy is <clears throat> so here's our example again with a hot pack in the hot pack we have um, iron reacting with oxygen to produce the iron 3 oxide and it's also producing energy 1625 kilojoules of energy hopefully you guys remember these symbols but let's go over it again this triangle is represented it's called a delta so the delta H or the ch and delta means change the change in enthalpy in Rx and we have to de we have to designate what are we talking about are we talking about the universe are we talking about a system are we talking about surroundings I'm talking about the change in enthalpy for this reaction Rxn is representing this reaction here so the change in enthalpy for this reaction is negative 1625 so take a look at this why is it say negative here well the iron and the oxygen lost energy see this is a product so since it lost energy it's negative so the change in enthalpy is negative because the system lost energy the iron and oxygen turn into an iron 3 oxide and it released energy and that's why it's negative if you give off so therefore all exothermic reactions are negative this is an exothermic reaction because it's giving off energy this is exothermic because energy is a product and therefore all exothermic reactions are negative hence can you think you could finish the sentence if all exothermic reactions are negative then all endothermic reactions would be positive so therefore all endothermic reactions would be positive okay let's try to give you some terms and see if you can put this all together first thing is when bonds are formed energy is released so when bonds form it releases energy but in order to break a bond you must absorb energy so in order to break a bond you have to add energy to break the bond so these are the basic rules of enthalpy when bonds are formed energy is released and in order to break bonds energy must be absorbed so I'm going to tie this in with this idea here exothermic reactions in exothermic processes products have stronger bonds than the reactants in endothermic products in endothermic reactions the products have weaker bonds than the reactants so this is a little bit confusing these last two things I just showed you and I want to tie it together right now with an example because honestly if you think about examples that you understand and you follow the evidence you can come up with to the conclusion that I'm talking to you about right now so whenever I think about exothermic or endothermic processes and I'm a little bit confused I use the example of water I think about water in my mind so exothermic means energy is leaving so if energy is leaving water if energy is leaving water then the water is going to get colder right it's losing that energy and if it gets cold enough it can phase change into ice 
And if it's endothermic, that means I'm adding energy, right? Endothermic means I'm adding energy. If I add energy to ice, then it's going to start warming up and it could eventually phase change into water. Okay, with that idea, I know what exothermic and endothermic is, and I can think about it in real world situation. Um, exothermic products have stronger bonds than the reactants. Now this just memorizing the sentence is a bit difficult, but if I think about it like this, exothermic products, so here's exothermic, the product is ice, has stronger bonds than the reactants. That makes a lot of sense. Ice definitely has stronger bonds than water. And the opposite will be true as well. Endothermic processes the products, like water, would have weaker bonds than the reactants. And so if you can think about things that you understand in the pieces, you can put them together to make this understanding of what I just said over here and what I just said over here. Okay, so slow it down, think about it. Don't try to memorize these sentences. Think about what you know understand go through the process and that's really that's real understanding and that's what we're driving for real understanding not memorization of things that you don't understand there's no point in that all right so what we are talking about with enthalpy um, is the change in enthalpy represented with a delta h this triangle means is a is a symbol delta and whenever you see this that means change in so what is change in enthalpy and i think really what i'm focusing about on uh, in this point right now is that what is change in itself so it's something that takes um, you can measure change in enthalpy over the course of a reaction and it can be calculated by subtracting the enthalpy of the reactants from the enthalpy of the products so Whenever you see this delta and, and uh, change in, it always means that it's going to be final minus initial. And in reactions, the final is products. So it's always going to be products minus reactants. But anytime you're measuring the change in something, you're always going to take what you finally have minus what you started with, whether it be your bank account balance or the energy in chemical reactions. Uh, if you have a positive change, that would mean that you have more product or you ended with more than you started with. So if you if you um, end with more energy, more product than you started with, then it would be positive. And that would be an um, endothermic reaction. And if it was exothermic, then your product would have less energy than the reactant. So a small number minus a large number would be negative. So enthalpy is, or any change, is final minus initial. So when we see this delta H, that's what I'm talking about. This is an energy diagram. And there's some important concepts that I need you to understand here because I might ask you on a test or quiz to either draw one if I give you a chemical rea um, reaction or I might ask you to um, interpret things from it. So. One thing you're going to notice is the reactants, here's the reactants, and this is the, the reaction for the heat pack again. Uh, the reactants are always going to be to the left and the products will be to the right. So if you take a look, the reactants are more left and the right. So um, what has more energy will be higher up than, in other words, it has more enthalpy. And in the case of a heat pack, the reactants have more energy than the products. So energy was lost to create the products. The products have less energy than the reactants. How much energy was lost? Negative 1,625 kilojoules. And you know this referring back to, just just um, scroll back a little bit um, in the video and you'll uh, you'll see that if you forgot what the reaction for a hot pack was. So this is that hot, that hot pack reaction. So anyways, like I said before, energy is neither created nor destroyed, the first law of thermodynamics. So if it lost 1,625 kilojoules, we do need to note where did that energy go? And that energy went to the surroundings. Um, it, it's going, it's leaving the system. And if you happen to be around a hot pack, that heat will be traveling towards you and you would feel warm. Uh, because it's losing energy, it's a negative value, um, we, it would be less than zero. And anything that has a value that is less than zero, any negative values are considered exothermic reactions. So exothermic reactions, the reactants always have more energy than the products. The products always have less energy. This is an energy diagram for my endothermic reaction. In the endothermic reaction, we had ammonium nitrate, 
uh, that was the reactant and we open it up uh, or expose it to water and it becomes ammonium and nitrate ions and it required energy for this to happen in other words the product now has more energy than the reactants where did that energy come from it had to come from the surroundings so we're talking about the flow of heat is 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 which direction is it flowing and in this situation the flow of heat is moving into the system the reactants are gaining energy to make this product here and we have the value from our equation that we put here so I put my reactant on the left my product on the right because I am um, gaining energy I'm gonna make my reactant on the lower line um, when I do this energy diagram so make sure that you kind of pause the video and understand the difference between endothermic and exothermic um, diagrams and that you'll be able to diagram on your own because I'm gonna ask you to do one right now this is the workshop for what I just talked about. If you understand these concepts, you should be able to move through this uh, relatively easy. What I would like you to do right now is pause the video and try to answer these four questions that have multiple parts to them. Pause the video now and do that because I am going to talk about the answers to all of them. But I'd like you to try it first. So pause it. And hopefully now you're back. So let's talk about the answers to these. All right. Uh, number one, why does the change in enthalpy for an exothermic reaction have a negative value? Why does the enthalpy change for an exothermic reaction have a negative value? The reason is because um, it's negative because the reactants are losing energy. It's negative because the system is losing energy to the surroundings. It's negative means losing. So why is it um, negative for exothermic it's because energy is being lost it, the system is losing energy it's going to the surroundings number two what is happening to the heat of a system in an exothermic reaction okay the system that that let's think that's the hot pack what's happening to the heat of um, the system in exothermic reaction well it's losing heat the heat is leaving the system in an exothermic reaction. Or if you want to think about water turning into ice, heat is leaving the water to turn into ice. So for the system, heat is leaving in exothermic reactions. What is happening to the system in an endothermic reaction? Okay, in that example I gave you earlier in, um, in class, well, we talked about endothermic reaction, a cold pack. Um, energy is going into the cold pack to dissolve it. Uh, or, or we could think about ice. Um, becoming water. That was another example I gave you in here where energy is being added to the ice, endothermic, it's being added and it's becoming water. So in both cases though, um, in an endothermic reaction, energy or heat is being added to the system. How about this one? What is happening to heat of the surroundings in an exothermic reaction? So if you think about an exothermic reaction being a hot pack and you think of yourself as being the surroundings now. So the hot pack is losing heat energy, but the surroundings, which could be you in this case, you would feel warm. So the surroundings are gaining heat energy or enthalpy in exothermic reactions. Remember, the system is losing heat energy in an exothermic reaction, but the surroundings is gaining that energy. So what is happening to the energy of the universe in an endothermic reaction? It doesn't matter because the endothermic reaction is gaining energy. The surroundings are losing energy. The universe is neither gaining nor, uh, nor losing energy. This is the first law of thermodynamics that energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's constant. Number three. Um, explain the meaning of delta H of reaction. So delta H reaction. Why is delta H reaction sometimes positive and sometimes negative? So what's the meaning of this? I am talking about the change in enthalpy for a particular reaction. That's what this means. The meaning is the change in enthalpy for a particular reaction. That's what this is. Change in enthalpy for a particular reaction. Why is the change in enthalpy for reactions sometimes positive and sometimes negative? Well, because reactions will either be sometimes endothermic in other words they will sometimes gain energy or sometimes they will be exothermic that's negative they will sometimes release energy number four um, we have glucose I'm gonna say it's glucose C6H12O6 in a solid it's reacting with oxygen six moles of oxygen 
in a gaseous form and it's producing six moles of carbon dioxide gas and six moles of water liquid and it's producing 2,808 kilojoules. Okay, here's my reaction here. This is, by the way, a combustion reaction because something is reacting with oxygen and it's producing carbon dioxide and water. What is combusting happens to be sugar in this example, uh, but it could be anything um, and it, it would produce this. So this is, this is a general basic combustion reaction. Um, so A, is this an exothermic or endothermic reaction? Well, because the energy is a product, that would mean that the sugar and the oxygen are losing energy. It's a product. That would mean that this is an exothermic reaction because energy is a product. It's important that you don't just understand that this is exothermic, but you understand how to determine that. And that is because um, energy is a product. If the energy was a reactant, that would be an endothermic reaction because that would mean the system is gaining energy uh, for this to happen. And draw an energy diagram for this. Okay, an energy diagram for this would look like, um, well, should I do that? Okay, I will make one for you. Hold on. All right, so um, in this reaction, we have, um, we're going to be measuring the change in enthalpy. So as we go up, the enthalpy changes. So I'm going to put um, H here. That's the symbol for enthalpy that in parentheses because that's the that's the unit or whatever so that's actually not the unit that's what it is so this is the enthalpy it's not the change the change is going to be what I put in the middle here so what are my products so well, basically this is the first thing I want to think about is this exothermic or endothermic well it released energy so it's exothermic so my reactants are going to have more energy than my products so I'm going to put my reactants up here which was C6H12O6 and oxygen. These were my reactants. And it's going to, my products, I'm going to put over here, my products have less energy and my products was, I should put the coefficient here, six of these. And I have my products, I've got six CO2 and six water. Okay. It lost, there was a loss of energy, and that was negative 2,808 kilojoules. There was a negative loss of energy from my reactant to my product. And yes, if you want to draw the line all the way here and here, that would be fine. Um, so my reactants lost energy. And if you remember in kinetics, I might have a bump up here. That would be, you know, so, so the line might look like this. Uh, that would be activation energy, but we're not talking about that in, in this, but this look, should look somewhat familiar to you from my, my last lesson that I talked to you guys about. So anyways, uh, that's our kilojoules. Where did this energy come, come, go? It lost some energy. This energy, the energy went to the surroundings. So um, it lost heat to the surroundings, okay? So heat went to the surroundings, and because this is because delta H is less than zero because it's a negative value, that would make this an exothermic reaction. Okay, so if you did something like this, give yourself a pat on the back. Good job. Uh, that's all I got for you on this lesson. I hope you did well, and I will talk to you soon.